One of the most precious privileges in the world today is the right to vote, to choose the man who will head the most powerful nation in the world during the next four years. The candidates have been named, the choice is yours. In the 1960 presidential election, more than a third of the eligible voters did not go to the polls. Only about 100,000 votes out of 69 million made the difference between victory and defeat. So no one can say his vote doesn't count. One vote could change the course of history. The supporters who turn out to hear Senator Goldwater are sometimes as large as this mammoth rally, sometimes smaller. But always they are fervently for him all the way. He brings them, he says, a clear choice to make in November, not an echo. Nor does he tailor his remarks to the known views of prejudices of regional groups. Often he takes locally unpopular stands to prove that he is consistent with the principles of his acceptance speech in San Francisco. His followers respect his refusal to compromise. Since Labor Day, Senator Goldwater has traveled tens of thousands of miles to discuss the issues of the campaign. The problem of civil rights, he says, cannot be solved by legislation, but rather in the hearts of the American people. He advocates the use of small tactical nuclear weapons at the discretion of NATO commanders. And he charges the Democrats with being soft on communism. These are old words to you, but appease an aggressor, try to make friends with him, and eventually you'll have to go to war with him unless you're willing to hand over your freedom without a fight, and I don't think Americans are. I speak as you speak, for peace, not war, when I say that America must take a firm line with communist leaders until their evil system ceases to threaten the world and threaten the freedom of man and the peace of the world. Other Goldwater charges are failures in South Vietnam, too much presidential power, and the decline of morality in our times. Barry Goldwater Jr. and the candidate's three other children work in a campaign that's notable for participation by families of all candidates. Also pitching in to help is Peggy Goldwater. Though by nature the shyest of all the contenders' wives, she, with or without her husband or children, makes public appearances where she thinks it might further the cause. Mr. Goldwater himself lists among his qualifications for the high office he seeks many years of business and military experience and 12 years in the Senate. He thinks his knowledge of flying and of electronics would help. And finally, that a Republican would be better than a Democrat for president. But Mr. Goldwater himself has admitted he is the underdog against a formidable opponent in President Johnson. However, the president, in turn, respects the intense campaign drive put on by the senator. Mr. Johnson carried his case to the people. Ignoring pleas from his staff and the Secret Service, he tries to shake every hand that reaches for his. To many, of course, he is the president first and a candidate second, but his speeches draw resounding cheers. As with the Goldwaters, the Johnson family is busy on the campaign trail, the two daughters, Lucy and Linda, find fertile politicking at barbecues. While their mother boards the Lady Bird special for a whistle-stop tour of the South where democratic defection threatens. Mr. Johnson seems assured of all of the labor vote, the most powerful single segment of the electorate. Day in and day out, he hammers at what he calls Goldwater's nuclear irresponsibility. His oft-repeated theme is unity and continuity, with a democratic president, of course. A united country, a unified America, submerging petty difference in common purpose, will find no limit to its achievement. We have the knowledge, we have the resources, we have the tools. All we need is the courage and the faith and the vision 
and you know in your heart that I'm telling you the truth. As the election drew near came the changes in the Soviet Union leadership, and Mr. Johnson was quick to point out that the world is looking more than ever to a stable U.S. leadership. Mr. Johnson set out on a political career 27 years ago, a road that led to the White House. Now the day approaches that he may have dreamed about in Texas long ago to be elected to the office that had been thrust upon him when tragedy struck in Dallas. When the polls open November 3rd, it will be you who will decide which man will carry on for the nation.